Hello to all of you and welcome to our third edition of the Avery Instruments Summer Symposium. Today's topic is about slit pane, slit microscopy with exchangeable fluoroforms. My name is Janina Hanna and I'm the Scientific Relations Manager at Avery Instruments and I'll be your host for today. Don't forget to register for the last symposium also in the series. Next week, Francesca Portanelli from Berlin and Florian Grimm from our sister company Averia are the guests in our live cell STAT webinar. But now, back to today's webinar. We have in total three excellent guests. First, Mike Heilemann will give a talk about his research and how the paint approach can actually help for STAT imaging. Next, Chris Spahn, the driving force behind the State Pain project in Mike's group, is open to answer any questions to Mike's talk or State Paint in general. And finally, my colleague Gero will show you live how State Paint works on our Avery Instruments State Microscopes. Please don't hesitate to ask any questions in the questions tab of this webinar software already during the talks. We'll answer as many questions as possible after each of the presentations. And if this is not possible, we will follow up via email and answer your question. Now, I'm more than happy to introduce to you our first speaker, Mike Heidemann. Mike studied chemistry in Constance, Heidelberg and Montpellier and did a PhD in physics and a postdoc in biotechnology at the University of Oxford. He started his research group in 2008 and is now a full professor and Chair of Physical Chemistry in Frankfurt since 2012. His research interests are the development and application of super-resolution imaging and image analysis tools to understand how proteins and protein networks organize into functional units in the cell. After Mike's talk, Chris Baum will be available to answer any question you have to the method. Chris himself studied biology at the Spook University in Germany and did his PhD thesis and postdoc together with Mike on the chromosome organization in E. coli by using super-resolution microscopy methods. At the moment, he holds an EMBO short-term fellowship to work with Ricardo Henriquez at UCL, which is unfortunately interrupted due to the current crisis. As the first author of the Stead Paint papers, he really is an expert in Stead Paint, and thus I'm really happy that you both are here today, Mike and Chris. Now, let's start with Mike's talk. Mike, the stage is yours. Welcome to this webinar. The uh, topic of this presentation is Stat Paint. And I will report on how exchangeable flow pores can be beneficial in applications of step microscopy. This project was mainly driven by two people who I would like to introduce right at the beginning, Christoph Spahn, postdoc Frankfurt University and Marco Lampe, member of the Advanced Light Microscopy Facility at EMBL Heidelberg site. My name is Mike Heilemann and I'm heading the single molecule biophysics group at the University of Frankfurt. Now this talk is mainly about how labels that non-permanently or transiently bind to a target can be beneficial for step microscopy applications and therefore I would like to begin with classifying labels in fluorescence microscopy, a little bit more in general. Now, I'm distinguishing two types of labels. The first ones are permanent labels. And chemically speaking, these are labels that covalently bind to a target, or at least with a very high affinity, sort of pseudo-permanently. And you can think of antibodies or high affinity tags and for some proteins. The second type of labels are exchangeable labels. And those exhibit a very weak affinity and they transiently bind to their target. And typically they're found in an imaging buffer and with a certain rate K on, they bind to a target and K off, they unbind or K bleach, they photo bleach. You could think of low affinity tags, but also of intercalators or minor groove binders of DNA, lipid binders, and also of DNA hybridization if you, if you have short oligonucleotides. tags. The second type of labels became prominent in the context of single molecule localization microscopy, another super resolution technique, which comes in different flavors. And one of the flavors is PAINT. PAINT stands for Point Accumulation for Imaging in Nanoscale Topography and was introduced by Sharonov and Hochstrasser in 2006. A few words about localization microscopy. 
The idea of localization microscopy is not to image all fluorophores of a target structure at once, but to separate the fluorescent signal and to isolate the signal into single point spread functions. So emission events of single fluorophores. If we manage to do that, we can determine the position of these point spread functions with some nanometer uh, precision, depending or scaling with one divided by the square root of number of photons. Now, if we repeat this experiment and stochastically turn on or label or light on uh, one fluorophore after the other, we can collect many coordinates and at the end we can reconstruct an image which has a subdiffraction spatial resolution. The beauty of paint labels now is that you put the labels in the reservoir and by adjusting the concentration, one can tune the number of binding events and the density of binding events. And by that, you can achieve the separation of emitters in time and record a subdiffraction image. There's a, a special characteristic about paint, which makes it very useful, which I'd like to highlight here. Because of this reservoir of sort of an infinite amount of uh, labels, there will be a fast replenishment. So even if once of the bound floor force is photo bleached, it will quickly unbind and it will be replaced by another one, which is very likely a not bleached floor force, still intact floor force. The consequence is that the, the intensity in a, in a paint experiment is constant over time. In contrast, if we are working with permanent labels, we are suffering from photo bleaching because there's no replenishment of the label, the fluorophore. This has been the starting point actually uh, to, to think of how paint labels can be used in other microscopy modalities. And the topic of today is how to use these paint labels in stat microscopy. Now, again, we are coming from the side of the permanent label, and we would see, uh, if we label a biological structure with that, we would see a decrease in fluorescence intensity over time. Whereas if we had an exchangeable label, and if we managed to efficiently and densely label the target structure, the exchange of the label would allow to have fluorescence uh, signal, which is rather constant over time. What's the motivation? Well, first of all, we can use optimal imaging uh, conditions, for example, laser power. And that will ultimately give us the best spatial resolution. We have long acquisition times. We can uh, perform multicolor experiments more easily. We can do volume imaging. And in, to some extent, we can do live cell imaging. Now, before I come to, to the concept of stat paint, let me briefly introduce stat microscopy. Stat microscopy was developed by Stefan Hell. And uh, the way we are using it here in this, uh, in this context of stat paint is the confocal approach. On the confocal approach, we are having two laser beams which, are, uh, which we overlay. The first one is an excitation beam, it's a Gaussian beam. The second one is a depletion beam, which has a donut shape. Now the excitation beam excites a fluorophore. The depletion beam induces stimulated emission. The depletion beam has a non-zero, has a zero intensity here in the middle. And if you overlay both of them, this results in an effective point spread function, where only the very tiny central part um, allows to detect fluorescence. And it's this uh, sort of uh, shaping of, of beams which uh, achieves the spatial uh, resolution and the super resolution. Now, if we want to uh, integrate paint labels into step microscopy, we have to, we have to think about two, uh, uh, two parameters which are different to single molecule localization microscopy. Let's start with the first one. I said earlier that we are dealing with an infinite pool of labels, our reservoir, and in single molecule imaging, we adjust that pool to have a concentration which will sparsely label, label our target structure. Instead, microscopy, we want to have a rather continuous and high density labeling. So we have to work with higher concentrations. 
in the imaging buffer. That's the first parameter. The second one we have to take care of is we want to have exchange kinetics. So the, that's the unbinding of the fluorophores and the binding of the next intact fluorophore. We want to have exchange kinetics that fit the imaging kinetics in order to have an efficient replenishment of labels. And these two things have to be integrated if we want to use paint labels for step microscopy. Now, let me first introduce two very simple um, fluorophores uh, for, for this approach. And I will begin with Nile Red, which is a, uh, a lipid binding dye. It's a fluorogenic dye that, uh, when, if it's in the imaging buffer, it shows nearly no fluorescence. But once it binds to lipid bilayers, it's, uh, it shows uh, a strong fluorescence, a high quantum yield of fluorescence. We use Nile Red as a uh, exchangeable dye, and we compare it to another dye. And for that purpose, we chose a spectrally similar, very photostable dye, Alexa Fluor 594, labeled to WGA, and that also labels the cell membrane. We decided to use Bitkeria because they are easy to, to image, and it's uh, relatively simple to keep the imaging plane, and that's good for uh, the intensity analysis. Now, from these images, you can directly see that uh, for the permanent label, we have a decrease in intensity over time, whereas for Nile Red, we do not see this, uh, this decrease over time. And we plotted this here for two different intensities, for a low and a high intensity. A low is a red and a high is a black. And we compare the, the exchangeable label for both intensities. These are the lines here on top and the permanent label. And there's a huge difference in terms of photobleaching. We don't have any photobleaching for Nile Red. And we have strong and even stronger at high intensity photobleaching uh, uh, with the permanent label. Well, this was a first uh, try. We then went on to, a, to another experiment. Um, and here we set up to uh, uh, compare the same fluorophore, but once as a permanent label and once as an exchangeable label. And for this purpose, we teamed up with Luke Labus from Genelia, who provided us uh, with uh, Genelia Fluor 646, once conjugated as an azide, which allowed click chemistry incorporation to label the bacterial nucleoid, and once labeled to the Hurst dye, which is a minor group binder, and that allowed, allowed to use the same fluorophore as exchangeable label for DNA. And you can see that these structures are rather similar, Again, we compared the intensity or followed the intensity over time. And for uh, JF646 permanently labeled to the target structure, we see bleaching, which increases with laser intensity of the stat beam. And for the exchangeable uh, JF646, we see a rather constant signal for um, uh, over time. Now here at this point, uh, let me mention two numbers which are important. Um, thermodynamics, so the binding affinity, and the KD is in the range of 1 to 10 micromolar. These are uh, ranges which prove to be uh, working well in this concept. And K off is in the range from 1 to 100 per second. I'll come back to that. You might wonder why these are such huge ranges. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can couple these kinetics to uh, the imaging kinetics. So we have uh, other means to control efficient labeling and efficient exchange in a step microscopy experiment. Now, following these two uh, uh, experiments, let me show you a, a third type of label. This is uh, a paint label of the second generation, if you like. It's the LifeAct peptide, which uh, LifeAct uh, labels actin. And we have labeled this peptide with Alexa 594. And it became uh, also prominent for localization microscopy as iris label. Uh, we use that label to uh, uh, label actin in eukaryotic cells and to record stat images. And what you see here is the sequence of many, many stat images of one recorded after the other. The uh, peptide is still in the imaging buffer. We use a concentration of one micromolar. And if you follow the, the, the fluorescence signal over time, you see again that it's, it's uh, very much constant over time. Imaging power or thermodynamic parameters and kinetic parameters are listed here. So this is in the range of uh, what I showed you on the previous slide. Now, 
let me come to that point I briefly mentioned. So uh, we need uh, to have an efficient exchange and we have quite some flexibility which lies in the design of uh, a stat experiment. So uh, what you can do is you can balance the exchange kinetics with the imaging kinetics. And I put this uh, in, in two very uh, simple categories. The first one is the exchange uh, uh, Kinetics may have, might be very fast, so we have a fast recovery of the label. Then uh, you could think of repeating scanning uh, the same line. You could use uh, repeat line scanning for n times and accumulate uh, signal, and then you could continue with the next line. Now, if you if you had a slow recovery, you would probably image rather image the first line, repeat the full frame, and then begin again at the first line and repeat uh, full frame imaging for n times. Now, these are two parameters. There are, of course, other parameters like pixel dwell time, and you could also uh, integrate uh, uh, some waiting period in between. And this gives you uh, a huge flexibility um, to match the exchange and the imaging kinetics. Now, now after this introduction, let me just uh, show you a couple of uh, of uh, applications of um, paint labels on step microscopy. And I'll begin again with a membrane label. Now we are in a eukaryotic cell. We use a membrane label that targets uh, sort of many different types of bilayers which we have in a eukaryotic cell. This is, of course, the, uh, the uh, cell membrane, plasma membrane, but also many intracellular membranes. And from the structure, you can uh, sort of identify those as uh, mitochondria and others might be. Uh, other types of organelles in a cell. Already from visual inspection again, you can uh, uh, acknowledge the, the increase in spatial resolution. Um, we can, of course, draw line profiles and look at the inner architecture here of these uh, mitochondria. And it's pretty clear that the, uh, we get a, a decent spatial resolution with these exchangeable dyes. Now, this is uh, one color imaging. Um, a real benefit of this uh, approach of using exchangeable devices go to multiple colors. One example here, where we use the, uh, the LIFAC peptide to label actin and host SIR as a DNA labeling uh, dye. And the advantage here is that uh, you sort of bypass the difficulty of choosing uh, the right excitation and depletion lasers in a two color paint experiment. Because even if you uh, bleach, one through four while imaging the other, you don't have to care too much because these are getting replenished. And so you have the full flexibility for optimal uh, settings, for optimal Im imaging settings in two color or even multi color imaging. We can do this in three dimensions. And this is one example coming back to bacterial cells. They have been labeled for the membrane, again, not red, and for the DNA. And you can uh, uh, sort of uh, acknowledge the, the DNA ultra structure, which is inside uh, these bacteria. And we get a very beautiful uh, 3D stat uh, resolution of these cells. Grady imaging um, of, uh, of large volumes is uh, the next uh, thing I briefly want to introduce. It might happen if, you, if you're thinking of thick samples and you have, if you're thinking of uh, 3D stat imaging using uh, um, let's say 40 nanometer um, um, axial step size. It might happen that you're bleaching uh, flow force which are in the planes above, such that the signal decreases over time. And this is not the case here. In that case, uh, we have the constant replenishment. So we have uh, the same signal strength across the volume of the sample. And now ultimately, uh, ultimately, uh, we can also use this approach for live cells that paint imaging, and then that gives, gives us access for, uh, to, to, to follow dynamics of uh, organelles. This is a fission and, and fusion of, of these mitochondria. Um, and this is, uh, this is quite interesting, but yet it requires a label that is live cell compatible, which, which enters the live cell. Um, and uh, if you have such a label, you can follow your uh, organelle dynamics for a long time without uh, any signal loss. Now, to summarize this first part, uh, I introduced you uh, the concept of using paint labels in step microscopy. 
I introduced you a couple of different labels for lipids, for DNA, and for, for actin. And there are quite a few others which you could work or think of. Um, and I showed you a couple of applications. Now, I want to uh, bring this on the next level into protein specific uh, stat paint imaging. And for this purpose, we integrated the concept of DNA labels into stat paint. DNA paint uh, labels again are uh, or became prominent uh, in the context of localization microscopy. There's a technology called DNA paint, and it builds on the reversible and transient uh, hybridization of a fluorophore carrying imager strand to a docking strand that is, for example, conjugated to an antibody, and that is again linked to a specific property. Adjusting the concentration of the imager strand. Uh, determines the signal density in a single molecule experiment and the length of the hybrid determines uh, this, the, the duration of the signal. These are again the two parameters we actually we have to take care for here if you want to integrate this into step microscopy. The first thing is we need higher concentrations of these imager strands and the second thing is we need shorter hybridization uh, lengths compared to single molecule imaging, because we want to have a faster exchange of these labels. Now, having said that, here are two very uh, basic results showing that with a so-called P1 label, this just determines the DNA sequence that has been used, has been shortened to eight nucleotides compared to nine or 10, which are used in single molecule DNA paint imaging. And uh, we, uh, we can show that we efficiently labeled the target, and we are now comparing this, this uh, exchangeable DNA paint label to the covalent label, again using the same fluorophore. And for the covalent label, we see a signal loss after many frames. And for the dynamic label, we see that the signal, uh, fluorescent signal, is kept much better over time. Now, these DNA uh, uh, paint uh, label allow integration into antibodies, and that makes this technology um, uh, sort of protein specific. You can think of any uh, targeting any protein where you have an antibody for, and use this uh, idea of exchangeable labels and step microscopy to visualize that. And uh, again, you can do that in multiple colors, and like shown here for two different structures, or here, tubulin and mitochondria in three dimensions. And of course, uh, with all the, the, the other things I presented you in the earlier uh, step paint concept. You can also combine DNA paint labels together with the classical paint labels and use both of them. Um, this is showing the iris label together with the DNA paint label targeting um, um, actin and um, tubulin. Now, <clears throat> to, to finish up with, I would like to uh, bring uh, these type of paint labels in a, in, in a larger context um, of a different microscopy modalities. And as an example, I chose DNA paint or DNA oligonucleotides um, and to, to introduce the two important parameters again that are uh, relevant in your experiment. But for a single molecule experiment, for example, DNA paint, you want only very few binding events in order to discriminate them as single emitters. So you're working with a low concentration of emitter strands. At the same time, you want to have longer binding events to, to collect sufficient photons for uh, uh, a very precise localization of your emitter. Now, on the other side, for step microscopy and also for confocal and other techniques, you want to have an efficient labeling or continuous labeling of your structure, so you're working with higher concentrations. You also want faster exchange of your probe. So in the context of DNA, you would use shorter oligonucleotides. This can be uh, put into context of third microscopy technique, which is fluctuation imaging, or SOFI. In SOFI, we do not want to have single emitters, but we do not want to have a continuous signal over time. We still want to have fluctuations in fluorescence, and this is achieved by uh, operating intermediate concentrations. And I would like to take this uh, to, to give you an outlook where, uh, for example, uh, these exchangeable labels uh, can also be very useful. 
And this is a project that Marius Glocker in Frankfurt uh, is working at. Um, Marius is a postdoc and he collaborates together with Jörg Enderlein and Götting. And Marius is using uh, these paint label, labels for SOFI imaging. So precisely at the uh, 10 to 20 nanomolar concentration of these fluorophore labeled imager strands. And uh, this uh, allows you to get a bleaching independent signal in SOFI. And that again allows to go for a second and even third order reconstruction. And uh, this is the gain in resolution as shown here by the reduction in width of tubulin filaments. And of course, all the other benefits I introduced for step paint are also valid here. You can do multicolor imaging um, relatively in a relatively simple way. Now, with that, uh, this presentation is finished. Um, I would like to thank the people who are involved in this project, Christoph, Marius, and Marco. I would like to thank the collaborators, Luke in Genelia and Jörg for Sophie uh, in Göttingen. I would like to thank Ferio Instruments, who have been tremendously helpful in optimizing uh, uh, the uh, experimental parameters and working together on, on a recent conference and producing a uh, quite amount of nice imaging data. And I would like to uh, thank funding my own group and most importantly, you for listening. And I welcome you to uh, contact us uh, with, uh, if you're interested to use this technology or if you have specific questions, you find us our contact information on, on our homepage, smbunifrankfurt.de. And uh, once again, many thanks for joining this webinar. Cool. Thanks a lot, Mike, for this great talk. And now we have Chris here as the absolute expert for step paint, and he is available for your questions. So, hi, Anina. Hi, Chris. Um, so, thanks for your kind introduction, and um, also from my side, a big thanks that we can contribute also to this amazing webinar series. I'm looking forward to the questions. <laughs> great. Thanks, Chris. So the first question is, which properties must transient labels have to work for step paint? And is there a general guideline how to choose a suitable label? Okay, well, um, that's a very good question. So um, Mike already gave some hints on that in his presentation. So whether a label is suitable for step paint can be in a first step derived from its thermodynamic and kinetic properties. So what you want the label to, to have is like a weak affinity so that it does not bind for too long. So if you consider the um, dissociation constant, you want to have this parameter to be in the range of like one to 10 micromolar. So for some labels that we use, for example, that's uh, for the lie effect, it's two micromolar. For the um, DNA paint labels, that's eight micromolar. So this gives you already a good starting point because you know the labels don't bind for too long. Um, Another thing is that you want the label to detach um, fast, and you can uh, get that by high um, K off rates, which are in the regime of one to 100 um, per second. So this then enables that the epitope is set free again and can be um, bound by intact labels. What I would then do is I would take the label of interest. Um, and perform a titration experiment using normal confocal microscopy and see in which range you get a good labeling. And then also perform like time-lapse imaging with a high laser power to see whether the bleaching um, is prominent and um, your signal drops within a few frames. And if your signal is stable after a few frames, then you can be quite sure that this label also performs well in step microscopy. So this is like a small guideline how I would um, explore new labels to see whether they can be used in step paint microscopy. Cool, thanks. Next question. Um, can we combine step paint with expansion microscopy? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, we haven't looked into that yet, but actually 
when the epitope is conserved um, in the expansion process, um, that might be possible. And that will then give you really, really nice um, resolution. Because what also comes in here is that many paint labels are um, very close to the target, meaning you have very small displacement of the label to your target structure. And this in combination with the expansion should give you very nice resolution. So for the DNA, I guess that should work quite well. Um, for membranes, I'm actually not sure how the membranes are conserved. Um, regarding it's the DNA paint labels, for example, you have different issues that arise with the hybridization buffer. Because if you have expanded samples, um, those are very prone to shrinking if you add buffers with high salt concentration. And in that case, um, if you add the buffers for DNA hybridization, that might lead to a collapse of your sample. So you have to be quite careful, but here again, you can maybe um, fiddle around a bit with the sequence of DNA paint. Um, I have no experience in that yet, but that's a very interesting question. And um, yeah, that, that will be great to look into that actually. I guess so too. Next question. Have you tried stat paint in small tissue or tissue sections as well as in single cells? Um, <laughs> also not yet. Um, so I guess um, what was shown before is that NIRED, for example, diffuses very well into tissues. So using that for stat paint um, is um, very promising. I guess it always depends on the size of your label and whether there are charges on the label or not, um, because diffusion into the specimen is the, the key to um, successful stat paint matching. I guess for small labels like um, Life Act or the DNA um, probes, um, so the Higgs conjugates, that should be no problem if you have a slight or yeah, permeabilization um, step before. For DNA paint labels, that gets probably a bit more complicated because the DNA strands bear a lot of negative charges. And I don't know whether those labels can penetrate um, the sample well at those time scales to record, record the stat images. Yeah, also, this um, is something that is very interesting. And yeah, maybe at some point I, we will also be able to look into that. But I have no experience yet with that. Thanks. Thanks. Um, next question. How often is high background signal from unbound fluorophores an issue? Um, we worried about that in the beginning when we designed um, the concept, but actually we were really surprised because um, due to the optical sectioning that you have in confocal microscopy, you don't have too much um, background um, signal. So for NIRED and the Hux conjugates, that's less of an issue anyways, because those um, fluorophores are fluorogenic, meaning they just fluoresce when they bind the target structure. But also for the life egg that we used in one to two micromolar concentration, we did not see much background. Um, so the optical sectioning is doing a really good job, meaning that you don't have too much background fluorescence and quite nice signal to noise ratio. Um, yeah. So in general, we had like signal to noise ratios of, uh, let's say, between 10 and 20, which is quite nice to um, visualize structures of interest in our case. Yeah, nice. OK, um, the last question is, what is the actual speed to collect one image? Um, as for any other technique, um, that strongly depends on the region of interest that you want to image. Let's say if you have a eukaryotic cell and you want to image one slice, it might take one or two minutes to build up uh, an image. Well, that also depends on the signal that you want to collect. So the more you accumulate the signal, um, which you, um, yeah, the longer it takes. But let's say for one cell, one, two, three minutes should be okay to get a nice image. But if you go for 3D imaging, that can take uh, also uh, much longer times, depending on how thick the, the cell is. Um, yeah, can also be in the in regime of hours. But that's a compromise you have to take into account 
between resolution and image quality um, and the temporal resolution. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot, Chris, for all these great answers to the questions we got. Yeah, thanks and... also for those great questions. <laughs> thanks to our audience for this. So now thanks again, Chris and Mike, for joining us today in general. And next, I'm more than happy to introduce you to my colleague Gero Schlötel. Gero is one of our application scientists at Abere Instruments, and he has a profound background in biochemistry and biophysics. During his PhD in Glasgow, he developed a fluorescence-based DNA assay and then joined Bonn University to actually supervise a STAT microscope facility. Since almost four years now, he works in our team and we are extremely happy to have him on board. Gero will now introduce you briefly to our expert line software and then he'll show you on three different samples how STAT paint can actually help to acquire excellent STAT images. Gero, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. The stage is yours. Thank you. I'm going to give a short practical demonstration of stat paint in action. But before I do so, I will revisit how we gain resolution in stat microscopy. We can see here a confocal image of fluorescent beads. The beads are about 20 nanometers in size. However, in the confocal image, they appear about 220 nanometers in a profile. And this is because the confocal scanning spot is much larger than the beam size. Now, if we switch on STAT, we can see the typical donut shape pattern. And this will switch off the dyes at the periphery of the confocal scanning spot, leaving effectively a smaller spot and the beads will now appear about 130 nanometers in size. To gain more resolution, we need to increase the power of the STAT laser, and then the donut shape pattern will appear saturated, leaving only a very small spot in the center where fluorescence can happen. And this very small spot allows us to image the beads appearing nearly at their actual size of about 22 nanometers. Now, Increasing the STAT laser power to gain resolution has one drawback, and that is bleaching of the fluorophores. This used to be a major problem in the very early days of STAT microscopy. Nowadays, the machines have advanced a lot, as have the fluorophores. That means today we can routinely acquire STAT images at a high resolution in our labs without any problems. And we're talking about bleaching only when we're talking about the top resolutions, when we're talking about volume imaging or movies where we expose the sample multiple times. Now, at the end, the goal will be high resolution at high brightness. And at Berry Instruments, we will reduce dye bleaching while maintaining the resolution to achieve this goal. Good starting point is using good dyes. And nowadays, there's a lot of commercially available dyes that work really well with stat microscopy. But we also have a sister company, Aberia, and they produce a large range of dyes just perfect for stat microscopy. We also use very efficient APD detectors in our microscopes, which means that we get brighter images and we need to expose less, which in turn produces less bleaching. We also use fully pulsed STAT microscopes, which means the excitation laser as well as the STAT laser are both pulsed lasers, which reduces bleaching and allows you to achieve higher resolutions. And a last point would be adaptive illumination, which is exclusive to our microscopes. And that is a technique where we reduce the amount of illumination of the sample at the same resolution. We'll talk later about what that roughly is. And in a later webinar, we will go and discuss this in more detail. Now, when we come to stat paint, we don't really worry about bleaching of the fluorophores. We simply replace the bleached dyes before we continue imaging. And that requires transiently binding dyes, as described earlier. And from the microscope side, this requires to adapt the scan speed to the speed 
of the die replacement. Now there would be two scenarios, basically one with fast replacement of dice and one with slow replacement of dice. First going to talk about the first case where we have slow replacement of the um, dice, which is similar to the situation of actually scanning a very small image area. And that's because if you have a small image area, the scan gets faster and relatively speaking, the die replacement appears slower. Now, what happens in detail? If you look here at an image being acquired while we're scanning the first line, we are bleaching the dies. Then we move to the next line and we acquire basically the whole full frame. By the time we arrive at the bottom, the first line has already recovered again, meaning the bleach dies have been replaced with fresh ones from the medium. What we can do now is we can record this frame again in the same way and get a second frame with good intensity. We continue this basically recording a movie and at the very end of the movie we add up the intensities from each movie frame leaving us with a very bright image. A good example here is E. coli because E. coli is small and as I said before that will make the die replacement appear especially slow and we will acquire these movies. Now I have some E. coli stained with Nile Red on the microscope. That's a membrane stain. There's also a stain for DNA, which is in this case silicon rhodomine hooked. Here you can see our expert line software interface. We also have a facility line software, which is geared far more towards entry level and facility users. And we'll show that in a later webinar. Here in the expert line software, we can control really every single parameter of the microscope to set up very expert measurements. However, we also have an easy entry point to imaging here, which is called the easy commander here. And we can basically pick a die or multiple dies from a list and easy commander will automatically set the correct parameters for this die or multiple dies including excitation lines and, for example, the detection window here. You can also select the scan axis here, like X, Y, and Z, set up a movie, set the pixel size, and so on. There's an even easier way to set up imaging experiments here, and that's by going to the template list. And I can select a template which is generated from a previous measurement. Basically opening, for example, this paint template here, will open multiple windows and each window has settings attached to it, which I have previously used in this experiment. So I can repeat my imaging experiment with exactly the same settings again. Now going to the first window on the top left here, starting this in live mode, I can see on the left the Nile red stain and on the right the DNA silicon rhodamine stain. We'll draw a region of interest here. and drag and drop that into the next window. The next window has finer pixelation settings attached to it. And by dragging and dropping the region of interest here, I can start scanning in that region of interest with a finer pixelation. Now I can use this, for example, to refocus here. like so, and then I can focus in on one of these bacteria here by drawing a new region of interest exactly in that area. I can drag and drop that region of interest into the next measurements. The window here on the left has attached settings for confocal and stat imaging, basically normal resolution and super resolution imaging. And when I start the scan, you can see on the left, the confocal images, and on the right, the stat images. On the right, the stat images have higher resolution. I think especially for the DNA, you can see more detail here, finer structures. What you can also see is that the Nile red signal is rather weak, especially in the stat image. 
Now, at this point, we want to take advantage of the paint method, basically of dye replenishment while scanning and increase the signal in these images. And again, in this image here on the left, when I scan at each frame, you can see now the intensity is kept at the same level. However, the overall um, signal is rather dim. Going to the next measurement window, you can see I'm doing the scan multiple times over, but now I'm adding up the signal from every single frame in this image. What you can see is, especially for the Nile Red stat image here, which was previously very pixelated due to the low signal, you can see here a nice smooth stat image. But also in the DNA image, I'm getting more detail here. While we're scanning, I can draw a region of interest here onto my structure. Right click to do a time measurement in this case. What we can see is that we have an initial drop of fluorescence intensity here. Maybe I make this a little bit larger. You can see here an initial drop, which is basically bleaching happening in the first time I'm recording the stat image there. But then after a time, this stabilizes at a lower level. But this lower level is still very high. And in each frame, we collect plenty of signal. Adding this up, we get a very bright image. Now, going in, zooming into the image, I'll make this maybe a little bit larger here. I can now see finer details here, which probably was not very visible in the previous image here, where we recorded only one frame. So for example, in this area here, I did not see that there's a little bridge here in between this structure. However, when, when I accumulate lots of signal, it is clear that there's more substructures here. Also, it's very hard to see these little fine dots up here, for example. Here they're barely visible, but it's not clear what is noise, what is real signal. Now, this was just a plain XY view and using stat and confocal mode on the in the left window, only one frame, on the right, multiple frames accumulating. When we're doing stat microscopy, when we're switching to volume imaging, it will be interesting to also switch to 3D stat. 3D stat means we are not getting super resolution only in the X, Y axis, but also super resolution in the Z axis. What I will do for this purpose is revisit my X, Y scan, my crop window here, and also do an XZ scan, which is a vertical slice here. And I will select from that an area of interest in the Z axis. And I also define here the X, Y axis from this window. And now we'll start the volume imaging. You can see now the image is always accumulated again. This time I'm only accumulating three frames every single time. At the moment we see an XY view and on the left the confocal images, on the right the stat images. 3D stat increases the resolution in all three dimensions and we will notice that especially when we switch to the orthogonal views later on.
when recording super resolution volume images, we are usually recording very closely stacked Z layers. And it is possible that while you're recording the current slice, you're privileging the following slices. Normally, we would use adaptive illumination to reduce this bleaching effect. But here, the dyes are replenished from the medium, so we don't need this image mode right here. And I think now we've gone through most of the bacterium. I'll pause this here. And I can see the orthogonal views here going through my bacterium here. And you can see the resolution, especially among the Z, along the z-axis, is much increased here. I'll make this a little bit larger. So this is the 3D stat image in a vertical slice. And in the other axis, going through here, you can see here the confocal image, here the stat image of the Nile red stain, and here on the left you have the DNA stain in confocal mode, and on the right in 3D stat mode, and you can clearly see this one blob on the confocal image is now two separate DNA structures on top of each other. And I can now scroll through this to see more of these little structures here. And thanks to the paint method here, we are not losing signal while scanning and we get a bright image through all Z layers here. Back to the presentation. While changing samples, I would like to show you an animation. It's an animation of a volume we recorded a few weeks back. And on the bottom, we can see a confocal image and on the top, a 3D stat image, same sample or similar sample, equalized stain for membranes and DNA. I think we can nicely see on the bottom, the DNA in green appears like large blobs. And on the top, we can see substructures. And some blobs appear like one blob, while in stat mode, we can see there's multiple structures. We've also seen some dye replacement effects in other samples before. Here we're looking at living cells stained with silicon rhodamine tubulin. And we have used in this movie, which has about 110 frames, adaptive illumination to reduce bleaching. However, we've also seen that if we record these movies very slowly, say overnight with about five to 10 minutes between movie frames, we don't need to use adaptive illumination as much because the sample bleaches less. And this is because we leave the um, silicon rhodamine tubulin stain in the imaging medium and it will replenish the bleach dyes in the sample over time. However, this effect is rather slow, so you have to go for very slow movies to make use of this dye replacement effect. The very opposite would be our scenario two, where we have very fast dye replacement. It's similar to a situation where we have a very large image area because when we have a large image, scanning is rather slow and relatively speaking, dye replacement then appears much faster. Now in detail, when we are scanning an image here, while recording the first line, we always have bleaching just around the current position of the scanning spot, but when we reach the end of the first line, the first pixel in that line has already recovered, meaning the bleach dyes have been replaced with fresh ones. This means we can now do line accumulations, repeating this first line multiple times, and then add up the intensities for a bright image. To record the full frame, we will then slowly move to the next lines until we're done with the complete image. This, this mode has one major advantage, and that is that we don't get motion blur because with line accumulations, even if the stage drifts or if we have living samples, the resolution will not change. We won't get motion blur 
all we'll see is maybe a little bit of a distortion in the sample uh, in the image. Now, our example for this case or for this scenario is HeLa cells, again stained with Nile red, but in mammalian cells, Nile red will stain mitochondria, lipid droplets, ER, a bit the PM or plasma membrane. And what will be interesting to see is if we can reveal some Christie structures in the mitochondria here. Back to the expert line software interface. I'm going to start a scan using the template selection again. This time for now read in HeLa cells. We agreed with a few empty windows. The first one is an overview scan. And in live mode, I can see a cell stained with Nile red. Now I'm going to make a region of interest here and drag and drop that into the next window. And in that window, I can scan this region with finer pixelation. Here you can see now the mitochondria as tubular structures and very bright dots, which are lipid droplets and some dimmer structures, which are presumably ER structures. Pausing the scan, I will draw another region of interest to zoom in a little bit further. And in this case, I will then drag and drop that into the next window. And the next window has settings for confocal and stat imaging, meaning normal resolution and super resolution imaging. Starting the scan, you will see the image is building up very slowly. And this is intended because we want to give the dyes enough time to replenish from the medium between each line which is scanned. And this is because in each line you will experience some bleaching of the dyes, so they have to be replenished from the medium. Zooming in a bit, you can see that the mitochondria appear as large tubular structures in the confocal image. And going now to the right of this image, you can see in stat mode that there is now a substructure visible. I will change the lookup table a slight bit. And please keep in mind that this is raw data, so I'm not filtering or sharpening anything here. And yet you can see very nice the Christie structures within the mitochondria. Zooming out a bit again, you can see this will take a wee while to acquire a whole image in this scan mode. However, the image on the other hand is very nice and bright and sharp. Now, just to demonstrate the effect or the benefit of using such a large area for scanning to help the dice to replenish, I will actually now go and select a smaller region and scan in a smaller area. So I'm stopping the scan here zooming in on a region here, making a smaller subselection, and just scanning with the same parameters in that area. Now, I'll adjust the lookup table to the same level. What you can see is at the edges, the bleaching is not as bad, but in the center, you can see the brightness having suffered quite a bit compared to the original image where I'm using a larger frame. So I'm just for comparison, I will zoom into this area here now and compare it with a new scan, which is definitely quite a bit dimmer. And that's basically only because the dice had less time to diffuse back in after each line. In this scan, I've been using 10 line accumulations here so you can see an easy commander, and that's enough to get a really bright image here. I'm going to make this window small again. I've also been using some custom settings here, which is indicated by the easy commander reset button to the standard settings. 
and I've been doing this using a live dialog called channels and there I can set manually for example the stat power and the excitation power and the stat channel for example which is what I have done here. Now I would like to show you an image that I've recorded a good while ago on a comparable sample. And I'll make this a little bit larger. And zooming in, you can see very nice um, Christie structure. In this image, I've been using even smaller pixels, so therefore the image looks a little bit smoother. And an interesting area would be, I think, maybe here. And we can see very tightly packed Christie here. And I'm now going to draw a line profile through this. See the line profile here. And I can measure the distance between, say, two of these stacks. And that's about 60, 61 micron uh, nanometers here. And here it's about, again, 63 nanometers. Each of these peaks maybe has a width of, say, 26 nanometers maybe a little bit larger if you go and measure this one here, which would be about 31, 32 nanometers. So pretty good resolution here with a very simple lipophilic dye, which is now red. And back to the presentation again. This time, while changing the sample, I would like to talk about something that I mentioned early on, and that's adaptive illumination. I will not give a full introduction to this topic that will be done in the next webinar. However, here a quick overview. What we see here is a fluorescent sample on the bottom in the black box. We see green fluorescent structures. And what would happen in normal standard STAT microscopy is that we expose the full sample to the STAT laser to gain resolution. In adaptive illumination, on the other hand, we will try to block most of that STAT laser light and not illuminate most of the sample with a STAT laser. However, we will allow illumination of the fluorescent structures where the stat laser is needed for the resolution. And this is obviously a very simplified model here and you will hear more about this in the following next webinar. In essence, the effect of adaptive illumination is that you have less illumination of the sample less illumination of the structures as well, while maintaining the resolution of the STAT microscope. Now, for the next sample, we are again looking at fast eye replacement and we are imaging large image areas, which means we are going to do line accumulations again. We are again looking at HeLa cells but this time stained with a different dye. And we're looking at Life Act Alexa Fluor 594 conjugates. That stain will mark the actin skeleton in the cells. They're fixed cells. And the Life Act dyes will exchange from the medium into the sample. And back to the imaging software again. I will start again by selecting a template, this time for actin and HeLa cells. In the first window, we have an overview scan, and in live mode, we can see a nice actin staining here. We see the stress fibers here. I will select the subregion 
somewhere around here. Scan this with a little bit finer pixelation here. And again, we can see the stress fibers very nicely. I'll also transfer this region to the next window, which has presets for confocal and stat imaging. Starting that scan, we can see as before that the image builds up relatively slowly. And this is because we want to give the dyes time to replenish from the medium in between two lines while we're scanning. In total, I'm doing here 10 line accumulations. Adjusting the lookup table slightly here and zooming in. We can see lots of fine fibers here compared to the confocal image where we see mainly the larger bundles. As this image will complete in a few minutes, I will pause this here. and show you an image which I've recorded earlier today. And here we can see in this complete cell very nice staining of fine fibers, especially in this region here. Maybe make it a little bit brighter, just in case this doesn't display very well through the webinar transmission. And zooming in a little bit more even. I hope you can see this now on your screens nicely too. So I'm quite happy here with the actin structures labeled. However, there's still a few little gaps in the structures, which is probably from my fixation protocol. And I know that Chris Spahn can fix these cytoskeletal structures a lot better. And we have actually imaged one of Chris's samples on the Trends in Microscopy conference this year. And I would like to also show you an example from that conference. I'll open that. Making this window a bit larger and zooming in, I think we can see very, very nice, very fine structures here. Again, I will make this a little bit brighter so you can see this on your screen too. And I'll zoom in a little bit further just in case compression doesn't allow you to see this. I'll move to another region here and basically everywhere there's very nice fine structural detail. And I'll close this again here. At the end, I would like to summarize. I think today we have seen that we can achieve high resolution stat images independent of bleaching when we're using stat paint. We can use a high amount of illumination and that improves brightness. We can do volume imaging as we've seen today but we could also do movies, for example. I would like to mention that stat paint is compatible with many existing stains, as long as they are transiently binding. We've also seen today that the scan speed can be a little bit limited in stat paint. And I would also like to mention that if you do immunostainings, you will need to use DNA antibody conjugates which is an extra step in your protocol, but it is doable and can lead to very nice images 
also in multicolor. And with this, I would like to thank you for watching. Thanks, Gero. That was a really nice presentation. And I was especially amazed by the actin structures. Those look really stunning. Thank you. I learned a lot from Chris there. <laughs> so um, we have, we got a lot of questions. And here's the first question for you, Gero. Does that paint increase the resolution? I'm just switching on my webcam here again. OK. Um, yes, stat paint can increase the resolution. And that's because when we usually are doing um, stat microscopy to get more resolution, we need more stat laser power. And if we go there to the maximum resolutions, we will have a bleaching effect, which means your image is getting darker at some point. And um, when we're using stat paint, um, this bleaching and uh, darker image is not a problem anymore. So we can basically crank the stat laser up to an even higher power and get even higher resolution. So that's the idea here. And um, that helps a lot. This is also what we do when we use adaptive illumination. We also try to uh, reduce the bleaching with our um, adaptive illumination module. And therefore, we can also go already higher with the stat power and get higher resolution. So two comparable approaches, one on based on the dice and one based on our software and hardware. So um, same idea here. And yeah, you can get higher resolution. Okay, cool. Thanks. Next question. In step pane, the sample is immersed in exchangeable dyes in an aqueous solution. Please let me know the volume of such solution. If the volume is large, this will be a very expensive experiment because we need a lot of fluorophores. Yes, that's that, that would be true. Um, I mean, we're not working at massively high concentrations, higher than we would use for, say, um, storm or something. However, um, as described earlier, but we're using a rather small volume. So I'm using a in the, here a well, you could call it a quick and dirty approach to 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 the chamber. It's just a little slide with a dent or well in it, and I'm putting the cover slip on top which means the volume is only about 200 microliters maximum. I would say more like in the 100 microliter even probably. And um, that means the cost for the dice is not, not massive. And when you look at some of the dice like Nile Red, they're actually very simple dice and they're really affordable. So um, it's a nice technique as well to, to considering that you can use very simple dice in some cases. Yeah, true. Next question. So you keep the Nile red at a low concentration in the imaging buffer, correct? Remind me again what you're using as the imaging buffer. So I have been using just simple PBS, I think pH 7.4 here. Um, I know that uh, Chris, I think, has been using a more TRIS buffer with a slightly higher pH, which is in general better for most dyes to, for bleaching and uh, brightness there. Um, I've just used normal PBS here in the Nile Red sample, and that worked fine for me. Um, it wasn't as bright as with the other buffer, so I used about 600 nanomolar, I think, instead of 300 nanomolar in there. So yeah, I kept it low-ish, the concentration, and just simple PBS buffer. OK, cool. Next question. Does that paint work in living cells? Um, yes, uh, I think the Nile Red has been um, shown to work nicely in living cells. The other example, which I quickly mentioned in between, was um, another dye, which is probably not really thought of as a paint stain, but it's uh, the silicon rhodamine tubulin stain. And that basically has a very slow diffusion there, or slow um, replenishment, which means you have to wait a bit longer between the frames if you're doing live cell there to get a replenishment effect. And I see that generally when we do something overnight with like five or 10 minutes break in between each frame. If you do it quicker, you need, for example, adaptive illumination to reduce bleaching. Otherwise, you will get quite a bit of a de decay in uh, brightness from frame to frame. 
Okay, thanks. Next question. In imaging experiment of mitochondria, the stat laser intensity was just 28%. If the intensity is increased, the resolution will be higher. How strong the stat laser could be in this experiment? You can go up to about 40-50% with our high power laser, which has quite a bit of power. It's about three watts that laser has. So um, we have quite a bit of room to the top. We could go even higher, I think. However, um, then becomes slower and slower because what happens then is that when you crank up the resolution really high, the signal um, reduces a little bit, even when you're just recording otherwise with the same excitation settings. So then you would have to um, you know, do even more accumulations or give things a break in between. So in generally, um, going up to 40% roughly will give you a good contrast at a reasonable speed. Otherwise, you will have to think about going only very shortly over each pixel to not privilege even the next pixel in the line and so on. So uh, um, yeah, you can do strategies to go even higher because you're pretty much in the Nile Red sample, nearly unlimited with the dice and the structures. But um, it depends on your time really a lot, um, how far you want to go. Okay, thanks. Final question. Can I use that paint with immunostaining? Um, yes, that's um, possible. And um, in that case, you will need the technology which has been described in between, which is uh, DNA paint, um, which means you basically have to label either your primary or secondary antibody with a little DNA fragment. And then you will, in the next step in the staining procedure, add the uh, uh, DNA uh, complementary strand onto that, which is then labeled with a fluor four. Um, so yeah, it's possible. Uh, it's an extra step, which you might think, oh, this is extra effort. However, it also gives you some other chances. So you could use this, for example, using different DNA strands to do multiplexing of lots of different channels and different targets in there, which might be interesting for, for the user. So I think that's apart from this al nearly unlimited illumination of the sample, you can go and get maybe some extra color channels, which you can then sequentially record. And that would, maybe allow you to do quite a few different channels in one image or in one sample. Okay, nice. Cool. So thanks a lot, Gabo, for joining us today, for answering the questions and also for your great demonstration. Thank you for listening. And also thanks again to Chris and Mike for their awesome presentation and the great answers to questions. And finally, we got also so many great questions from your side. So thanks a lot to our audience for your awesome participation. Unfortunately, we couldn't answer now all of your questions, but we'll get back to you via email and answer your questions. And of course, if you have more questions, please don't hesitate to contact us directly. And also get in touch with us if you would like to demo our STAT or MinFlux microscopes with your own samples, either live with us in Göttingen or remotely. This webinar was part of the Avaria Instruments Summer Symposia. So please don't forget to join us for the next and also last event of the series. Next week, our guests are Francesca Bottanelli and Florian Grimm. And first, we'll have two excellent talks about live cystic microscopy and the suitable, suitable dyes for it. And afterwards, we'll show you on our facility line how to acquire live cystic videos with our adaptive illumination feature. With this, I thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our webinar and see you next time. Have a nice day, stay healthy and bye-bye. <laughs>